Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. We have a speaker today who is going to dispel one of the most pressing controversies facing Western civilization today. That controversy, of course, the plague of wildcat deniers. Once and for all, he will put to bed the fake news that the zero was better. So stand by, it could get ugly, but it's gonna get resolved. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Mark Liebman. That was great. <laughs> so, um, for those who don't know, I'm a retired Navy captain. Um, and in Navy parlance, I'm a fully qualified naval aviator. And by that means, I flew rotary wing. And because the Navy starts everybody in flight training and fixed wing, I am qualified to fly both. But people like my friends Mike, Mike Rabin and all the fixed wing guys and my son who's an F-18 bubba, they're only partially qualified naval aviators and I point that out all the time. <laughs> anyway, so um, I'm also a docent at the Cavanaugh Flight Museum in Addison, Texas. Uh, I work on the restoration team and do some other things for the museum as well. And this presentation came about because I was uh, watching a TV show on World War II, in fact, it was the Battle of Guadalcanal, and um, the conventional wisdom uh, that Cindy pointed out was that the Wildcat was uh, vastly inferior to the Japanese Zero. And so I looked at that and I went, hmm, let me go do some digging. And by the way, I, yes, I've written a few novels, uh, but about 40% of the time I uh, spent writing the initial draft of the manuscript, is spent researching. So I do a lot of researching and become somewhat of an amateur aviation historian. So the question I began to ask myself if the Wildcat was such a crappy airplane, why was the exchange ratio in favor of the Wildcat throughout the war? And these are actual numbers that I've actually researched. I can give you the sources if you want. So the point being here is if you look at, uh, and I'm looking at the lower end of the, the um, uh, chart, if you look at when the Wildcat first entered service in 1940-41, and they flew at the Battle of uh, Midway, and then at Coral Sea, or actually Coral Sea, then Midway, and then in Guadalcanal, the exchange ratio was kind of low. We were facing the Imperial Japanese Navy. Their pilots were highly experienced, more so than our pilots. And we had to learn how to fight in the Wildcat. And by the end of the Battle of Guadalcanal, the exchange ratio had gone from 1.51 in favor of the Wildcat to uh, 5.91. So the question is, why? So I'm going to spend some time talking about the development of both airplanes, and then I'm going to get into the, the reasons why uh, from doing some research. So the first thing about the Wildcat is its first enemy really was not the Japanese Zero. It was the Brewster Buffalo, the F-2A. Um, it had a very, very short service life in the U.S. Navy. Um, and both airplanes, the Buffalo and the Wildcat, came about um, when the Navy asked for an improved fighter over and above the F-3F, which is known as the Goshawk. It was a biplane fighter. It looks a lot like a Wildcat, except it's got two wings. Um, anyway, uh, the Brewster Buffalo wins the competition. But the Navy said, hmm, maybe, because we have a long history of Grumman, let's try, let's build a few Wildcats and see what we ha have happen. But they ordered 40 Wildcats and 108 Brewster Buffaloes. So Brewster, as it did throughout the war, had horrendous delivery problems, mostly due to quality, quality control. Uh, the company was poorly managed. Um, it, it essentially couldn't build two airplanes uh, to the same standard. And um, once they got the Buffaloes in the fleet, they found out they had problems with the landing gear. Uh, the airplanes didn't need perform nearly as well as they, uh, the prototypes did. And so the Navy orders 54 F4 F-3s. The Dash 3, and I'll talk about this more later, uh, did not have folding wings, okay? It was a, basically a stiff wing airplane. The Royal Navy was looking for an airplane to replace the Gloucester Gladiators and the uh, Fowry Swordfish's airplanes, which were, by the way, both bi biplanes. And so they ordered a bunch of Wildcats. They called them the Martlet One. The French Navy, which didn't have any aircraft carriers, and the Greek Navy, which also didn't have any aircraft carriers, also owned or ordered uh, some Wildcats. 
both orders wound up going to the fleet air arm because France was conquered, the Greece was conquered in 1940, and so the fleet air arm said, hey, we really like this airplane, we'll take all you got. They were known, the, the, the French and Greek uh, F4Fs uh, were known as Martlet 1As. It's the only difference that. So the Wildcats first kill during the war was done by a fleet air arm pilot over Scapa Flow, and it shoots down a German JU-88 reconnaissance airplane. This is in, it happened on Christmas Day, 1940. The Wildcat also was used uh, in a lot of strikes, and for those of you who don't know, when we invaded North Africa on November 8th, 1942, we didn't have any airplanes that could fly from the British base on Gibraltar or the British uh, held islands of Malta to cover the beaches. So five aircraft carriers, four little escort carriers with 12 fighters each and 12 uh, Dauntlesses, and the USS Ranger with 30 um, F4Fs and Dauntlesses and a couple TBMs uh, provided the air cover for the first two weeks of the North African campaign. And uh, they were the Dash 4 models, which had the folding wing. They, instead of having four guns, uh, four 50 caliber guns, they had six. I'll talk more, again more about the differences. But they did quite well against the French D-18 520, which is an equivalent airplane in performance to the ME 109E. And the exchange ratio was quite favorable, like 15 to 1. Um, later in the war, the Wildcats in the, in the Atlantic Fleet uh, and the Royal, Royal, uh, Royal Navy were used primarily in anti-submarine warfare to help hunt sub submarines and uh, chase away the German Condor 200s, which were uh, essentially a long-range long reconnaissance airplane looking for convoys. And by the way, the last kill by a Wildcat was again made by the fleet air arm in the skies over Norway. Okay. So there are three basic versions of the Wildcat. Yes, there are more. There was even a float plane. Um, so you had the F4F-3, which is the original one brought to the fleet. Now the big differences between these air, the difference, big differences between the airplanes is twofold. One is the Dash 3s didn't have a folding wing. Um, the Dash 4s had 650 caliber machine guns as opposed to four uh, in the Dash 3s, and then the FM. Uh, ones and twos had the R1820 as opposed to the R1830. The big difference is the R1820 was a single roll radial and was a lot lighter and produ produced more horsepower. They all had two stage superchargers, um, and as you can see, the weights and performance uh, actually got better. And the FM2s and the ones were actually far better than the Dash 3s. Uh, and what's also interesting is polls by or uh, questions of asking the fleet pilots who are flying the Dash 4s in combat as they wanted to go back to the four gun wings as opposed to the six gun wings for the simple reason you carried far more ammunition. Uh, you were limited to about uh, 300 rounds per gun uh, in the six gun wing and you had close to 400 per in the four gun ring, wing. So this is just a summary of all the orders by order type and actually contract number. Uh, the bottom line is uh, there, Grumman built mostly F4, F-3s, um, and then this little automotive comp company we probably never heard of called General Motors built uh, the FM2s and FM1s. The reason being is if you remember back before we went to a standardized uh, designation system, the Navy had this funky system was the first letter was a type airplane, then a, uh, a digit. Uh, fr based on the number from that manufacturer. The last digit or last letter was the manufacturer's designation. So Grumman's number was F. The fourth airplane they bought, fourth design they bought one was the F4. So F4F and then the variations dash three, dash four, et cetera. And General Motors uh, number was M. So that's why you have things like TBMs and TBFs. Same airplane, one built by Grumman, one built by uh, General, General Motors. So on the other side of the Pacific, we had this little country called Japan. And about the same time, they realized they needed to improve the fighter that they had, their standard carrier-based fighter, which at that time was a Type 96. It was, fixed, it was fixed gear, open cockpit, and the Japanese Navy wanted a airplane that performed a lot better. Now their specs were, and their um, requirements were different than the Navy's, the US Navy's. And it's kind of interesting. They wanted this airplane to go 310 miles an hour, but they focused on aerobatics. And I'll talk a lot more about this focus later on, because the Zero was up, um, or the Type A6M, 
was optimized for aerobatics between around 250 miles an hour. Okay, it's, it was an incredibly light airframe. Um, they didn't put armor plate in it or armor uh, and self-sealing tanks. Uh, they didn't have radios in them. It was designed to be highly maneuverable. And they figured that the fighting spirit and the skill of the Japanese pilots would carry the day. So the type I'm going to talk about mostly is the Type 21, because it's the one that was built the most early in the war, and again, the one that fought against the Zeros, I was giving the Wildcats, at Guadalcanal, Midway, and the Coral Sea. So I'm going to focus on, on that airplane. And one of the other interesting things about this is that Sumitomo uh, Metal Company came up with a different alloy of aluminum. They called it super, um, what they call it, super, extra super dural aluminum. And the big difference is it was just as strong as the alloys built in the, or uh, molded or created in the United States, except it was more ductile and it was lighter. Ductile meaning it can bend easier, but it still has the same strength. So they also, the Japanese had problems developing engines of high horsepower. And so the first engine in this airplane was a 950 horsepower engine uh, made by uh, Nakajima. And eventually the Type 21s got to an engine that produced about 1,000 horsepower and then ultimately 1,000, 1,100 horsepower. And it, like the Wildcat, it had a two-stage supercharger. But it did not have a pressure injection carburetor. It had a standard float carburetor. And I'll talk again about that in a few seconds. So these are the, the four primary models of the Zero. Uh, again, I'm going to focus mostly on the 21 because that's the one that flew against the Marines and the Navy pilots early in the war. And I'm using the 1943, February 1943, as the cutoff date because that's the official end of the Battle of Guadalcanal. And oh, by the way, the Corsair arrived in theater and was an absolute game changer. So you can see that the, from a performance perspective, both airplanes were pretty, pretty similar. The Zero was a little faster, had a much better rate of climb but it wasn't tactically significant better. It was only about six or 700 feet per minute. It's enough to get away, but it's not enough to climb. It's enough to get in position, but it's not, not enough to, be, to climb away to escape. It, it could turn tighter. It had a much better rate of turn and radius of turn. And I'll, again, when I talk about dogfighting in this genre of airplanes, I'll talk about why that's not as significant as everybody thought it was. And as a result, the airplane was a lot lighter than the, than the uh, Wildcat. So this is a chart. What I took is a 21 and an F4F, a box stock right out of the specs from uh, the, the test reports that I found that the, uh, the US uh, did when, uh, with each airplane. So essentially, what would happen is every uh, 1,000 airplanes they built of one type, or 500, depending on the type, they would send it to either Wright Pad or Patuxent River, Maryland, and depending which service, and they would actually do a flight test of it. And they'd go through a whole entire flight test, and then they'd, they'd spit out these reports to make sure that the airplanes were performing as designed. So anyway, so the green says the airplane is a better performing airplane. The uh, yellow says that's the one that's in second place. So you notice there's a couple things. Is one's the wing loading of the Zero was a lot lower, lower than the Wildcat. Um, the rate of climb was 4,500 per meter. That was his initial rate of climb versus 2,900 in the zero in the Wildcat. So you can see that that would sustain itself up to, up to altitude. But once you got above 20,000 feet, the Wildcat starts to has a better rate of climb. It uh, is actually catching up in terms of speed, and um, it carried far more ammunition than the zero. The zero, the initial 21s only carried 60 rounds for the 20 millimeter gun, and 500 rounds for the two 7.7-millimeter uh, machine guns that were mounted on the cowling. So it didn't carry a lot of ammunition. Okay, so the airplanes were designed literally on the opposite side of the Pacific, and they don't look at all like each other, yet they were designed pretty much at the same time. And as I tell people, the laws of aerodynamics over Tokyo are the same as they are over Washington, D.C., and that holds true today. Um, the, the, you know, the laws of aerodynamics are the laws of aerodynamics, whether you're designing an airplane in Beijing or you're designing an airplane in Moscow, Washington, or Japan. So the airplanes look entirely different, but they were designed pretty much to the same knowledge, aerodynamic knowledge uh, of, the, of the late 1930s. So the Wildcat had a fair number of uh, advantages over the, the Zero. So this is kind of a, a, a thing. So, so this, the Zero could climb faster up to about 15,000 feet. 
the Wildcat had armor plate, and the armor plate behind the pilot weighed 120 odd pounds, and it would stop a 50 caliber ball round, not an armor piercing round. Okay, so if you hit that armor plate with a 7.7 .7 millimeter round, it goes ping. Um, it also had self-sealing fuel tanks, and for those of you who don't know what a self-sealing tank is, it's pretty simple. There's a bladder inside the tank. You puncture the bladder. It's, be, uh, it's got a viscous material between two layers of rubberized canvas. When the, you puncture the, 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 the viscous material, it hardens and, and oozes back together, covering the hole. Now, it won't cover a hole that's this big, but it'll cover a hole that's this big pretty easily. The second thing that the U.S. did in the way they designed the fuel tanks is they're pressurized, or actually there's a lack of pressure. So they suck the fuel out as opposed to pump it out. And what this does is the bladder compresses, and, and you see vents on the air on U.S. tanks, not armored vehicles, but U.S. tanks, and the vents allow the vapors or the fumes to dissipate or get, get out of the tank. So when you hit it with a tracer round, it goes through the, assuming it punctures the tank, it goes into the tank and there's no fumes to set off because the fumes is what causes the fire. Okay, and that's what caused the explosion. So if you're flying a zero and you have your tanks, which are basically sealed with a rubber, um, a sil like a silicon sealant around the edge of the tanks, there's nothing in it, it's pumping the fuel out. So as the fuel drops down in the tank, it's filled with vapors, you puncture it with a tracer round or a hot bullet, and it goes boom, okay? And again, there's no armor plate behind the pilot, so if you get a burst in from the stern and it goes through the fuselage and it's a 50 caliber round, I will guarantee you the pilot's going to have a really bad day. Um, so even though it had a higher rate of turn and a better thrust to rate ratio, the speeds were not that much different. And the real difference that we found uh, in fighting the Zero, with the Wildcat pilots, is that once you got the fight above 250 knots, the Zero couldn't maneuver really well. And the question is, is why? Well, it had long span ailerons and it didn't have a thing called a servo tab. How many pilots do we have in this audience? Okay, so you, hopefully you all know what a servo tab, but for those of you who don't, essentially on a control surface, when they, like an aileron, when it goes up, the servo tab goes down. And what it does is it provides an aerodynamic boost to the control, so it makes it easier to control, or, and it gives you more control, and it also gives you a constant feel. Zero didn't have that. So the Wildcats would dive on the Zero, or they'd dive away, and the zero pilots would get up above 300 miles an hour, and the controls got so stiff that above 350, you couldn't move the controls. So again, the, we learned this, again, through trial and error, but so the Wildcat tactics of the guys flying the Wildcats was initially dive, shoot, dive away, climb back and fight another day. Um, the other thing that the zero had a problem doing is it, in terms of gunnery. And the Zero had two 20 millimeter cannon. They were based on a Swedish design by Orkelon, uh, the same cannon used in the British Spitfires uh, and Hurricanes and, the, and any other airplane that was flown by the Allies during World War II. Um, but the ballistics of the 7.7 .7 millimeter round and the nose guns and the ballistics of the, the cannon shells and the Zero, its wing, gun, wing cannon, are totally different. And this drawing shows that obviously the 20 millimeter round is going to slow up more and it's gonna drop, because again, it's, a, it's ballistic and uh, gravity takes hold. So it's great when you're lying astern behind an enemy airplane and you're shooting at the enemy airplane and it's level, okay? Because you have a point where the, gun, the, the bullets converge and as long as you, that's typically about 300 meters or 300 yards, and great, they all converge, but after that, the bullets go in different directions. The 7.7s keep going out farther, the 20 millimeter guns, cannon shells go down, okay? When you get into a dogfight and you're not shooting straight and level and you're shooting at an angle of bank, this divergence gets even worse. And the bullets are literally, and the shells are literally going all over the place past this convergence area. And it makes it really hard to do what they call deflection shots, which is you're shooting, you're in a turn, the airplane you're shooting at's in a turn, and you're having to compensate for it's going over here, and uh, you have to compensate for your turn, and again, the, um, the shells go all over the place. So out of the tactics um, uh, that evolved uh, between the Carl Sea and Midway, there's two guys by the name of John uh, Flatley and John Flatley, Jimmy Thatch. They always get them mixed up. 
Literally, they were reading reports from the American Volunteer Group, that's Chenault's organization, and the struggles that the P-40 was having, and the B-model P-40s were having against the Zero. And so, Flatch, uh, Thatch and Flatley um, literally are sitting in his kitchen table with matchbooks, and they're playing around with how to, to take advantage of the Zero, uh, the Wildcat's abilities or uh, characteristics versus those of Zero. And they eventually came up with this thing called the Thatch Weave. The only squadron that used it during Midway was uh, VF2 because the only one that, that Thatch could, could train because it was his squadron. And then the other squadron on the, on, uh, uh, didn't know it. They sort of had heard it, they were briefed about it, but they didn't practice it. So none of Thatch's fighters got shot down by the Zeros, but they shot down a bunch of Zeros. Why? Because the Thatch Weave essentially uh, you have two airplanes essentially not quite line of stern, uh, uh, side by side. When a bad guy gets behind you, they turn towards each other so that they're coming around to attack the, the airplane that's now threatening the other, the, your wingman. And you keep doing this. Um, it evolved from this weave that you see where it says A, B, C, D, which is, you know, is S turning back and forth. And by the way, uh, I can tell you that as a rotor head having had, having uh, had to figure out how to deal with surface-to-air missiles shot at you from guys with the shoulder-mounted things, we use this tactic today. Uh, why? Because you can check six, and you also, as you're coming around, you can see the missiles, and you can actually deploy chaff and flares, depending on what you want, uh, to hopefully uh, decoy the missile. So the other thing that's a misnomer about dogfights in World War II airplanes is that none of the airplanes had a thrust-to-weight ratio greater than one-to-one. -one. If you're above one-to-one, -one, then you can literally maintain altitude on thrust alone, okay? So if you're flying an F-14, an F-18, uh, F-16, F-15, you have tons of thrust, you can make a level turn at any, pretty much any altitude. In fact, uh, if you've got a positive thrust-to-weight ratio, i.e. greater than 1.1-to-one, you can actually climb. Most World War two airplanes, it was down around 0 0.3, 0 0.4 to one. So uh, when you started a dogfight and both airplanes rolled into an angle bank, the pilots in the room will know you, once you get into an angle bank, the airplane is gonna start to slow, you have to add more power, eventually you run out of more power, and guess what, you start to descend. Okay, also every pilot in the room will know that the slower you get, the radius of the turn decreases. So if you have an airplane that can, goes around the corner, to use a modern term, uh, in other words, turns faster, the rate of turn advantage that it has begins to go away as the fight gets slower. The other thing I found reading about dogfights both in Europe and over the Pacific is most of them occurred below 25,000 feet. Most of them were down around 20,000 feet. And the sweet spot was in uh, the 15 to 20,000, 10 to 15, 20,000, that range. Okay, so uh, you're not at high altitude, okay? They're a descending spiral if there's more than one turn. And that's why the, the tactic of dive, shoot, scoot works really well. And here's another problem that the Zero had that I failed to mention. It didn't have what they call a pressure injection carburetor and a traditional float carburetor, just like the RAF Spitfires and Hurricanes. So when you roll those airplanes on their back, push the nose, pull the nose down, you are weightless, you are approaching zero G for a, a millisecond or a second or two before you got positive G on the airplane. Well, in a, pos in a con conventional carburetor, that's a float, float carburetor, the engine gets starved for fuel. The engine quits for a few seconds or two, you get what's known as a loud silence. And so, uh, while they knows the airplane is falling through the sky, falling through the horizon, as soon as you get positive G's on it, then the carburetor begins to work again, and away you go. So the Japanese Zero couldn't fly inverted for very long. They had to basically pass through the inverted position. The Wildcat had a pressure injection carburetor, which basically meant didn't care what attitude it was, it was going to keep feeding fuel to the, to the engine. So if you were in a, in a Wildcat and you just shove the nose over, uh, and to dive away from a Zero, the engine kept uh, uh, producing power. And the zero, if you, did, if you just shove the nose over, you had, you would, the engine would cut out for a second or two. If you rolled it on its back until you got the nose back through the horizon and got positive G's on the airplane, the engine is starved for fuel. So, um, this whole idea, is a, as I point to this, the, um, the rate of turn and rate of turn, rate of turn as you get slower becomes less and less important. Um, Okay, so 
I come back to this chart uh, because uh, by the time the end of the, the Battle of Guadalcanal in February 1943, the Wildcat had established ascendancy over the Zero and over the Imperial Japanese um, Air Force, our Navy's pilots, and actually the Army Air Force. So the question is, how do we do it? And I sort of boiled down to three reasons. And so this is the answer to why the record needs to be reset. Number one is the Navy began this program called RAGS, replacement air groups. We still use that term today for the fleet replacement squadrons. That's the fancy term that some consultant probably came up with, but everybody who wears a set of gold wings talks about RAGS. What the RAGS are is a pretty simple concept. You come out of the training command, you get your wings, you're assigned to fly in the Wildcat, you go to a squadron that does nothing but train pilots how to fly a Wildcat. And the instructors are all combat experienced. So you get your 250 odd hours, you get your wings, you show up in, on the west coast, the, the, the RAG was at Kaneohe on Hawaii, uh, on, the, on Oahu actually, in Hawaii, and you, you got 50 to 70 hours learning how to fight a Wildcat, okay? Um, the Japanese, on the other hand, kept their pilots, the top pilots, in the, in the frontline squadrons the entire war. So they either got killed, or they, they were, became debilitated through disease or wounds, and they were not recycled back into, into the training command to teach new guys, new pilots. And the other thing is that they didn't use this opportunity like we did to say, this is what worked in the fleet, this is what we're gonna teach you. Another group of guys came back and said, yeah, that really worked, but we've got some other tactics that work even better. So this constant uh, retesting and re retraining and adding new wrinkles to our tactics helped the Wildcat pilots that were going, being fed into the, uh, the Battle of Guadalcanal. The Japanese did none of that. And so as a result, uh, due to a lot of factors, not only this, but also the fact that the Japanese, uh, by the end of the war, were having problems getting fuel, so they didn't have gas to train their pilots. They were having problems getting raw materials, so they couldn't build airplanes fast, as fast as uh, the, West, the U.S. could. But the big difference was after 1943, the average U.S. pilot, Navy pilot, and Marine Corps pilot who took off on his first sortie had 350 or more flight hours. It's 50 to 75 in the type airplane he's, gonna, he's about to f go into combat with. The average Japanese pilot in 43 had 150 hours. Huge difference. So the net net is the quality of the pilots that the good guys were facing declined. Reason two. Three things, radar, radar, ra yeah, radar, radios, and combat information centers. So if you look at what happened in Guadalcanal in the Battle of the Solomons, the Japanese were flying south from Rabul. It's about a five to 600 mile trip, depending on the route you take. And the Australians had what they called coast watchers on a lot of the islands. They would see the Japanese formations, uh, and they'd get on their radio and say, 50 plus headed south and by my station. So now the guys in Guadalcanal hear the radio transmission, they know how far the distance is, they know roughly the speed the Japanese formation's flying, and they'd launched the, zero, the, they launched the Wildcats, and the Air Force had P-39s and P-40s early in, in the campaign based on uh, Guadalcanal. The P-39s were not turbo or supercharged, the P-40s were, and they would climb to altitude, and guess what? They could communicate with each other because we had a radio. So they could talk with the radio, or the radar uh, controllers based on Guadalcanal. Okay, so they knew the direction. They would vector them. Once they were picked up on radar about 100 miles to 150 miles from Guadalcanal, they vectored the F-4s and P-40s and P-39s into an advantageous position, generally above and behind or off to the side of the Japanese formation. The Japanese didn't know they were there. Uh, and if they did, they couldn't communicate. And so the Wildcats and the P-40s um, were in position to dive, shoot, and scoot. Um, the second thing is that, that after uh, Midway, the Navy began developing a thing called the Combat Information Center. It was a painful experience. The U.S. Navy got its clocks cleaned in the first and second battles of Savo Island. We had radar, we detected the Japanese, but we did not know how to to synthesize the information from the radar and distribute to the, to the forces engaged. And by the end of, four, end of 42, early 43, or excuse me, by the middle of 43, we had developed this concept called the Combat Information Center. And oh, by the way, 
the, the British helped us in this because they had a lot of experience from the Battle of Britain. And there's a, um, there's a story about a British carrier being sent to the Pacific because we were out of carriers. Um, and that we used that opportunity to perfect um, these tactics. So, so that was, a, the, so it became between radar, radios, and the CIC, we had better tactics, we got in a position to shoot. I also want to go back and talk about one other thing, and that's the, the training. Before the war, the US Navy um, spent a lot of time with its pilots teaching deflection shooting. That's shooting another airplane when you're in an angle of bank. 90 degree deflection shot means that he's, at, he's directly in front of you and you're at 90 degrees angle of bank and you got a crossing target. So you got to pull the nose around. Uh, it's just like shooting, how many hunters do you have? Shoot birds and stuff like that? And I'm sorry, this is California. Um, in Texas, about half the people would have raised their hand, three quarters of the people raised their hand. But if you're a bird hunter, any kind of hunter, you know that the duck is going here, you got to shoot here, okay? It's the same thing in an airplane. And so, um, the U.S. Navy pilots and the Marine aviators got hours and hours and hours of shooting uh, deflection shots. They also shot skeet extensively, so it became instinctive. So they didn't have to think, oh, I gotta get the nose of the airplane. It was basically they were flying the airplane as if they knew exactly where to put the nose of the airplane. Oh, by the way, oh, the, air, the, uh, the airplane I'm shooting at is in the, in the gun sight. Adjust the nose a little bit, pull the trigger. So this, this focus on deflection shooting paid dividends in, 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 in reason one, particularly later in the war, and we just got better at it because we got better gun sights. The last one is the airplane itself. There are so many instances of wildcats coming back peppered with 7.7 .7 millimeter holes and 20 millimeter cannon shell, cannon shell holes. Um, the airplane was pretty rugged. Uh, unless you broke the fuel line uh, in a wildcat, um, you're not going to do anything with a seven points and kill or kill the pilot or disable the pilot. You're just not going to do much to a wildcat with 7.7 .7 millimeter. 20 millimeter cannon, different story. Well, cannon shell in the cockpit, pilot has a bad day. Cannon shell in the back end of the engine compartment or the fuel cell, you're going to probably catch on fire because it's going to blow a big enough hole that the self-sealing tank is not going to do that, but the airplane won't come apart. You see so many gunfire, uh, pictures or gun, gun camera pictures of zeros and all of a sudden you see the gun flashes or the, the, the hits and the zero catches on fire and a wing comes off or a tail comes off. The wildcat, that didn't happen. Okay, So not only the airplane was grum, uh, rugged uh, and it had armor plate and self-sealing tanks, but it was rugged enough to bring the guys home with missing cylinders or shot up cylinders. I have a picture at home, I should use it. Um, my father in a P-47, his head sticking through the, can the uh, cowling or a 37 millimeter round went into the cowling of his P-47. Blew a couple jugs off. The R-2800 kept chugging away, not smoothly, but it brought him home. Though, again, the Wildcat, same thing. These, the, there, are, there are hundreds of stories of Wildcats being shot up either by ground fire or by enemy gunners or Zeros, and a pilot brings it back. So. The three things, training, uh, and the differences in training, um, tactics, radar, radios, combat information center, and the airplane itself is the reason why uh, the kill ratio was so much in favor of the Wildcat. So just a little bit of uh, note. So 43, February 43 starts, um, and the Corsair shows up uh, on Guadalcanal. The Navy gave the first 200 Corsairs that came off the production line, even though they were intended for um, uh, fleet squadrons. They gave them the Marines on Guadalcanal primarily because um, they wanted to give an airplane that was, com was uh, far superior to the Zero, to the Marines. Um, I do another thing about the Corsair, another presentation about the Corsair. But so the, the first Corsairs flew their first combat missions in February of 43. The Wildcats by that time we're now starting to come off the fleet carriers because there's another airplane called the Hellcat, which was starting to come off the production lines, but didn't re actually enter combat till September of 43. And the Wildcats went to the, what they call the CVEs. Uh, and you can see the different size of the air wings. I put this thing on here to show, you, show the non-Navy guys, or the guys that aren't familiar with different size of carriers, is the Jeep carrier was 500 feet long, and it's small. <laughs> An Essex class carrier, was 850 feet long, and compared to a Nimitz class carrier, which is 
almost has a flight deck almost 1300 feet long it's small when you look at as you're coming aboard coming downwind or excuse me upwind to, to go into the break at 500 feet it's still small <laughs> um, and that's in a t28 but anyway uh, but you also see the difference in the size of the air wings um, but the Jeep carriers did, did yeoman's work in the in Atlantic and they provided an interesting role uh, during the Pacific War. So by September of 43, the Wildcat, the Wildcat is now being relegated to, I use the word second class status, the Jeep carriers, the smaller carriers, the Corsairs and the Hellcats are here and you can see the exchange ratios. It's pretty healthy. Unlike the Air Force, to get a kill you, uh, in the Navy or the Marine Corps, you have to shoot the airplane down. You do not get credit for a kill if you strafe the airplane on the ground and it blows up, okay? The reason I point this out is in the Corsair versus Mustang presentation I do, the, air, the, the Mustang has a much better kill ratio than either one of these airplanes, but about 20% of their kills were strafing. Sorry, doesn't count. So, but anyway. The, the Corsair and the Hellcat were game changers. They were far superior to any model of the Zero that, that flew. Um, and by, by far and away, the Corsair was uh, a world-class airplane. So uh, I get, Cindy is going to allow me to do a commercial. I've written a few books. This is the first 10. I've got another one coming out right around the first of the year. Uh, the books at the top of this thing are based on the career of a young Navy helicopter pilot. Uh, the first two are about Vietnam. I flew combat search and rescue and special operations. Uh, the rest are, are more are, have different topics. Randall Harmless is about Nazis who want to create a Fourth Reich in Germany in 1976. I grew up in West Germany. My father was in the U.S. Air Force. Um, his wings are made of a, the wrong color or the wrong metal. Mine are gold. His are, I guess, silver. Um, sorry, Air Force, guy, Air Force and Army guys. I have to get that in. Anyway. Um, uh, and the reason I joined the Air Force, uh, the Navy instead of the Air Force, because the Navy would guarantee me pilot training, the Air Force would not. Um, so when I, forgotten is about POWs who don't come up home at the end of Vietnam. They're held by a drug lord, um, and when they're finally rescued and brought back to the United States, there are people in the U.S. government uh, who want them dead. Uh, Interlook is about hunting spies in the Pentagon. A young woman comes to the United States, has an unhappy life. Her husband's killed in Korea. Her mother dies at an early age. Her son is killed in Vietnam. She's working for CIA. She decides to get, become a spy. Uh, the Russians are trying to extract her because she's at director level, and the U.S. is trying to uh, find her. Uh, the Simmersh Island, uh, excuse me, Moscow Island is about chaos in the Soviet Union uh, in 91. It's based on true events, like all the books. Um, and a lot of people don't know, in 1991, we were sending food to the Soviet Union because it was about to go into a famine. In fact, by the spring of 1991, had we not done that, the Soviet Union would have been deep in famine. Um, but anyway, the story is about uh, chaos in the Soviet Union as it's coming apart. Uh, so, and as you, everybody knows who follows history, on December 24th, uh, so, uh, Gorbachev was out of power, the Communist Party was out of power, and Yeltsin took over the RSF, RSFR that we know and love today that's run by Vladimir Putin, who, by the way, was a participant in the coup in August 19th through 21 of 1991. And just like the head of the KGB who led it, Putin got away scot-free. Um, Simisher Islands incidents about Korea, North Korea, which is one of the largest producers of um, uh, illegal drugs in the world. It also is one of the larger producers of off patent drugs, they don't care about patents or intellectual property. They sell them in the third world for fractions of a cent uh, that what they, we, we would sell them or the countries that, are, that make generics and they don't worry about the efficacy of the drug either. Anyway, what happens is these guys, they're, they're, they're generals in the, uh, and an, an admiral in the Korean, North Korean Armed Forces. Um, they're running these drug, drug factories with the blessing of their leader, Kim Jong, ill and they decided to set up a base on Simisher Island. They leased it from the Russians and then Kim Jong-il decides to turn that base into a strategic missile base. So um, this has a lot of my stuff from my days on the Seven Fleet staff. Um, I'm going to talk about Flight of the Pawnee and then I'm going to talk about my, my latest loves or love in, in writing. Um, Flight of the Pawnee is pretty simple. The plot's pretty simple. Al-Qaeda sends somebody to the United States to kill 20,000 Americans in one attack. Uh, he figures out how. The book takes place primarily in North Texas in the Dallas area. Um, I won't tell you how he does it, but the good guys do uh, 
shut it down. It's the first of a uh, counterterrorism series. The second uh, comes, deals with another threat. Uh, comes out probably around the first of the year. Um, in September 2018, my publisher asked me if I was interested in writing an Age of Sail novel. Now, I grew up being a fan of Horace Hornblower and Aubrey Martin and, and Richard Balafel, written by Alexander Kent, uh, Patrick O'Brien, C.S. Forrester. You probably heard of those guys. And it took me a couple of nanoseconds to say, sure, I'll do that. And then he asked me, how long did it take, take, to, take to produce the first novel? And I said, ah, six months. Eighteen months later, <laughs> I delivered the first manuscript known as Raider of the Scottish Coast. And there's a lot of reasons why, and if you want to know, I can tell you. Uh, it came out in August of 2020, and three months later, it was a bestseller on Amazon. Uh, the second one came out this past August called Karen Aid. It's already starting to climb the charts. Four of these books, and you can see the logos on the little, the Go logos on, have become Amazon bestsellers. Um, they're not New York Times bestsellers, um, so I'm not there yet, but uh, they're pretty good books. So uh, with this, I'm happy to take questions from the audience about pretty much anything. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, the, the question is more of a statement. The French did have an aircraft carrier at the beginning of World War II. It was actually in the United States picking up a load of obsolete airplanes. I'll get to that in a second. And that's one of the reasons they bought the Wildcats. Uh, the ship was then brought to the Caribbean and interred. It, had, it did not have sea combat at all. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question is, is that the Navy um, didn't feel that the Corsair was safe on, the, on an aircraft carrier, could be landed on an aircraft carrier, and that's why they gave them to the Marines, and the Brits figured out how to land the Corsair on, on, a, on an aircraft carrier, and they loved the airplane and taught us how to do it. All that's false. Okay, so here is ground truth. I did do this presentation, similar one to this. It's called Corsair versus Mustang, which is the better fighter, and I get in, got into the, the history of the Corsair. So the first problem, uh, the Corsair passed its BIS trials, which is called Board of Infor Inspection and Survey, which means the Navy then signs off the airplane. It's allowed to come aboard boat, the boat. Um, what they found was, yeah, the airplane was a handful. The struts on the landing gear, oleo struts, the compression rates, and, the, and I'll get, I get into the, the difference, but the oil struts didn't compress, the shock absorbers didn't, were too stiff, and so what happened is the airplane would bounce, skip over a few wires, come down, and now you're 10, 15 feet off the deck, you're out of airspeed, you're out of ideas, and bang, you come down, and, um, uh, and you basically land on the nose, break the prop, you need, it's now a sudden stop for the engine, so you now have an engine change and a bent airplane. Um, and sometimes they went far enough because the guys tried to shove the throttle forward and fly over and they'd stall and then crash into the airplanes at the forward end of the deck. So they took them off. Absolutely true. Uh, Vought went into a program called Program Dog to fix this thing. They very quickly figured out the problem with the oleo. Um, it took a while to go back and retrofit them and actually design and build and then get certified the oleos. The curving approach that everybody talks about that the Royal Navy taught us Au contraire, we've been using curving approaches in the Navy since we had the Langley, okay, which is the first aircraft carrier in the 1920s. The, the, the Brit suggestion was to raise the canopy, uh, put the, what's known as a Malcolm Hood on the, uh, on the Corsair, which gave you much better visibility, and raise the seat rail so that you, hit, you could slide the Malcolm Hood up or back, raise the seat so you got more visibility over the nose. They also fixed another problem was that the cowl flaps were leaking hydraulic fluid and spray over, particularly when they're open in high power settings, which is typically what you are in a landing conveyor, and spray hydraulic oil, oil over, all over the canopy, which is not good for visibility. Uh, and then if you stick your head out the side, you're going to get hot hydraulic fluid all over your face and your goggles. Again, not really good. So they fixed that problem. There was a couple other bugs that they fixed. But by the end of 43, the Corsair was mostly in the Marines, but now coming back on board. By the end of the war, by late 40, by 44, the Corsair was beginning to replace the Hellcat. And the Hellcats basically were gone by the end of 46. The Corsair served in, through Korea and actually into the fit, mid to late 50s in res, reserve squadrons. The Corsairs were built with a last piston engine fighter 
built by the United States. The last one rolled off the production lines before, after, right after the end of the Korean War. So um, I've heard that story, and like I said, now you know ground truth. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm going to answer the second question first, and then I'll, I'll answer the first question. Uh, the first question was, um, why, is, why was the Hellcat and Wildcat, uh, excuse me, Corsair not put on the Jeep carriers? That's an easy question. I'll get to that in a second. And the second question is, is that the Zero didn't have folding wings. It had folding wingtips, and it was about uh, because the longitudinal spar, the main spar in the wing, was a, a single piece of aluminum. And by the way, you're absolutely correct in that. Um, however, um, I believe, and I, 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 one of the versions of the Zero, um, they had folding tips, okay, and, I, and to get performance, increase of performance to compete against the, um, the Hellcat and the Corsair, they actually took the wing tips off, and that's the 22, the Model 22. So, yes, they could not, they could not fold the wings. The reason why... Um, the reason why the Corsair and the Hellcats didn't go on the Jeep carriers was simply landing speed and weight. Um, the Wildcat, you can fly a fluid approach at, at 80 knots. Okay? The Hellcats were in the 90s, and the Corsair was right around 100. So, uh, you, and also, they are bigger, heavier airplanes, which means you need more, um, more strength in the wires. I can get into how they were, how they did it in those days, but essentially the retention system, uh, you got an 80, uh, eight, 600 pound, 6,000 pound airplane at eight knots versus a 11,000 pound airplane at 100 knots. The amount of tension you gotta have in the wires or strength in the re and the retraction system is just far greater. So, and that plus the fact the size of the ships, it's really small, like I said. Um, it's, the, the, the Jeep carriers were 10,000 tons and 500 feet long, and the landing gear is about 300 of that, if that. It's, like I said, really small. So um, the Essex-class carriers, the Hellcat was fine. The Corsairs were fine. In fact, we've operated Corsairs off Essex, Essex and Midway-class carriers before we had an angle deck throughout the Korean War, and it was fine. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Those statistics are absolutely correct. They are. Yeah, so the question is about the flying targets and why they have such a kill ratio, it's a favorable kill ratio. And uh, flying an airplane, they were flying B model P40s um, against the Japanese. And here's the reason why. I'll give you two words Claire Cheneau. Okay, Cheneau was an absolutely brilliant tactician. And very quickly he told the guys, and I've talked to John Bond because he lived in Dallas and he's actually, are the P-40 in the Cavanaugh Flight Museum. Um, it's got his markings on it from the days in the AVG. And Chanel preached this thing. Do not turn with the, with the Japanese fighter. The Chinese um, network of spotters would, would give, because they didn't have radar, would give the uh, AVG time to scramble, get above the Japanese formations, and again, we had radios. Japanese didn't have radios. So they would get above, they'd uh, fly around until they got in an advantageous position, point the nose down, come down, shoot, dive away, climb back, and fight another day. And it's, uh, it, he is the, and he was the, I don't want to use an inventor, but he was the guy who came up with these tactics. And uh, Thatch and Flatley read every one of his reports. There are articles in the Navy's archives where they, where they were interviewed after, uh, after they came up with the Thatch Weave and what their source materials were. And strange enough, Chanot's tactics were, uh, and his, his pilot's assessments and evaluations of the Zero in combat were the basis of the change in tactics that the Navy went through. The United States Army Air Forces didn't believe and didn't listen to Chanot. Um, and they paid a horrible price uh, fighting off New Guinea um, and other parts of the, uh, the campaign. And then also they didn't listen to Cheneau, um when they got to the European theater because the Spitfire could turn with most of the German fighters, the P-47, P-40, P-38, P-51 couldn't. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Very okay. Any other questions? Oh, wait a second. It, it, before I give you your second one, anybody else? 
Okay, fire away. Yeah, airplanes on it. The answer to that question is yes. The Navy had three levels of carriers. They had the fleet carriers, as they were called. Those are the, primarily the Essex classes. But early in the war, those fleet carriers were also the original Yorktown, the original Saratoga, and all those, those guys. Then they had what they call light carriers. Um, the, the, the size that was built, the ones that were built most was the independents. Um, and then they had the Jeep carriers, the CVEs. The um, light carriers, the CVLs, as they were known, were primarily used for uh, invasion support. Uh, these guys were primary, the Jeep carriers were used primarily for convoy escort, the troop ships in other words. Um, however, um, they were also used to resupply uh, and provide airplanes. Now, if you look at, if you ever looked in the photos of a hangar deck on a fleet carrier during World War II, you'd see fuselages and wings literally in the rafters of the hangar deck. Um, so they would carry literally spare airplanes. Um, but there are numerous cases where they would load the airplanes on, onto the, the, one of these carriers and they'd sail across the Pacific and they'd fly off replacements and that's how they got there. Um, it's also true that the Navy did this with the Air Force. I have pictures in, uh, of uh, back the original Ranger CV-4 um, off uh, the west coast of Africa with 120 P-40s on it. They're being flown to the Desert Air Force. And what they would do is they'd put them on a uh, nose to tail far back in the ship get to about 100 feet from the end. Uh, they have the external tanks on them. They put a kip, uh, covers, a canvas cover over the cowling. Ranger would, did, did this three times. would sail across the Atlantic as fast as it could. Um, they get to about 150 miles, 200 miles from, the, from this uh, Dakar, and the P-40 would start going off the bow. And then the, 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 air, the ship's air wing, which was now in the, hang, was in the hangar deck, would then be brought up, and the ship was now uh, a regular aircraft carrier. But we did it a lot. Uh, both, no, both the Navy and the Air Force. In fact, most of the P-51s that got to Korea were brought that way. Yes, uh, okay, the gentleman way in the back with the, man, I'll get, get to you, sir. Uh, the Pacific Theater, are these all? Um, the primary land-based uh, use of the Wildcat was Guadalcanal. Um, there were some other instances where it was land-based, but the rest of it was carrier-based. So the question was, well, did they have land-based or carrier-based, and that's, that's the answer. The, what happened is when uh, we lost a few carriers, the squadrons got sent to Guadalcanal. Uh, VCs happens. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, the Japanese. Okay, the question is about the Japanese tactics uh, with the Zero. The Japanese stayed with the the, the Vic, the three plane Vic, um, and the. Uh, typically, the third one of the pilots designated the Vic, if they, the, the formation was bounced, um, would turn towards the attacker and defend the leader, who is te technically the best pilot, and um, and that's what they they kept to that throughout the war, even though they realized it was unwieldy, um, and they did yes they did go to the point um, uh, of using a version of that sweep. Normally, what would happen is if, if a bunch of zeros, particularly after 43, will get attacked by Hellcats, Wildcats, and Corsairs, they get go into what's known as a Luftberry, which is a big circle, uh, to defend each other's tail. The problem with that is if you've got an airplane that the Corsair, you can climb and dive, pick one off, dive away, go pick one, climb back up and do, keep doing it. And also, oh, by the way, uh, eventually you're gonna run out of gas and you have to run for home. Um, so, um, it, it, the Japanese failed to adapt their, their, not only their training, but their tactics throughout the war, and it cost them dearly. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, not a question, but an endorsement. They took him out. Yes. So the gentleman was talking about his father who flew the Wildcat in the first three major battles of the, of the war. The Wildcat also, by the way, had a, uh, the front screen in front of the, the uh, gun sight uh, would stop a 30 caliber round. Um, so, uh, between the engine, which would stop anything, uh, except a big cannon, you know, a 16-inch cannon shell, um, you're pretty well protected. So as long as you, the guy didn't get a deflection shot into the canopy from the side, um, you have a pretty good chance of surviving uh, in, in, in the Wildcat. Um, the bad news is the, the fuel tank is between the pilot and the engine. It's literally right in front of the instrument panel. It's a big bag. Um, but, again, uh, it, had, it was self-sealing, so 7.7 .7 millimeter rounds, you're going to seal a 20 millimeter round, 
you get me on fire. Or chances are. Okay. I want, um, I'm, one last thing. I'm going to be up here signing, selling and signing books. They're $20 each if you give me cash. I take checks. I can do credit cards. Um, but if I take a check or a credit card, I have to charge a sales tax to keep Governor Newsom happy. Um, so thank you very much. It's been an honor to talk to you.